I'm Cree Agnew, and I'm president of the Slave Gorton International Policy Center, and I want to welcome all of you here today to our speaker series event. These are events that we do about every other month, very, very informal, where we invite a very special guest to join us, and we have a topic that we discuss. Slade will ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience to uh, ask any questions that you would like to ask as well. Um, and we're very, very honored and pleased to have Michael Medved with us today and Diane Medved also. So thank you both for being here. Um, I don't think Michael needs much of an introduction. <laughs> and you all know he's a national talk show host, best-selling author. We've got some of his wonderful books over here uh, that he'd be glad to autograph for you um, after the event. So uh, please uh, take a look at those. But uh, Michael, we're very honored to have you uh, with us today, and um, I look forward to the discussion. Um, at your place, you have two pieces of paper, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about Michael's background, so you have a copy of his bio, and then also the one-page description of the Gorton Center, um, too. And I hope after the event, you'll walk down the hall and take a look at the Gorton Center and Senator Gorton's uh, office. Um, we will be recording uh, this event, so we can use um, some of the information on our website and for people who uh, could not be here uh, today. So, Slate, why don't I go ahead and turn it over to you to welcome our guest, you're, 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 you're <laughs> and then we'll get started. <laughs> I was going to say, everyone has uh, Michael's resume in front of them, so there's no point in dealing with it. Well, I thought you were going to do this as well. But while we're in the book business, we're going to present you, this is your fee for the speech. <laughs> <laughs> your huge fee. Yeah. 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 It's invaluable. It's, it's a good read. Yeah. It is a good read. So Slade's biography was just released by the Washington State Heritage Center, the Legacy Project, and uh, it's a, just a great read. And we've got some copies over here, too. So that's wonderful. Slide, I, I'm sorry, I just saw you, a, so. a, um, a, a photograph here um, from uh, earlier in Senator Gordon's career. This is, oh, yeah. this so is there's some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> photographs in there. Oh, so. This is what, it's not only a good read, it's a good story. It is a good and, story, a very good story. Exactly. Yeah, but, so. uh, again, but, but with that and with your knowing the subject and knowing the resume, uh, we will just turn it over to uh, Michael for... Uh, whatever, however long he wants to start, and uh, then with a few questions from me, it will become uh, an open discussion. And uh, he already knows that it can vary from the specific subject to, to the extent that anyone wishes to cover other subjects. Yes, I, I, absolutely. And I'm, apparently, we can also give instant reactions to the Illinois primary, <laughs> which, uh, uh, which apparently was uh, called. I just got it. Text message. I'm, I'm, you read a text I read message. a text message. I'm not, I, I, I have pretended for years that my cell phone does not receive text messages. <laughs> but on, no, we all know uh, now. Um, uh, apparently, and, and, and I know this is a nonpartisan policy event, but apparently Governor Romney uh, has. Uh, Already won the state of Illinois by already with called. yeah already called by double digits apparently so significant. could be significant in any event um, uh, what a what an honor it is to be here and I, I in with so many distinguished people particularly with Senator Gordon here and particularly with this being a policy forum and a policy institute I do not want to pretend to any special foreign policy credentials. Uh, I grew up as one of those people who uh, refused literally until I was um, uh, in my 30s uh, to uh, travel outside the United States. It was a point of pride for me. And I've traveled all 50 states and I've been everywhere in, this, in the country and I've visited almost all the national parks. Not, have not finished the national parks in Alaska. But... Um, uh, but I, I really, uh, so I was very much an isolationist uh, um, American. And uh, now partially that's misleading because my parents made their first trip to Israel uh, when I was six months old. I, I do not have um, strong memories of, <laughs> of, of that particular trip. But I was there. We have photographs to prove it. And... Um, in any event, what, what I wanted to speak about was not so much a foreign policy issue as a public opinion issue, because that's what I do. Basically, I spend 
uh, my work day, uh, five days a week, talking to people. And I get to talk to all kinds of people, some of them wonderful, some of them wonderfully strange, uh, all across the country, who have, they tend to have very strong feelings about the issues on the table. And what I wanted to speak about specifically is American policy regarding Israel uh, and, and some of the misleading assumptions that are widely embraced, widely embraced in media discussion and, and also in informal public discussion about the state of Israel. And, and some of those misleading ideas are put forward by people who um, have no affection for the state of Israel. And some of those ideas are put forward by people who have great affection for the state of Israel, but are putting forward very destructive and very dishonest and misleading ideas, one of them in particular, uh, that they ought to know better about. So we will get to those in turn. Now, first of all, in the interest of full disclosure, I mentioned my, my, my late parents uh, uh, took me to Israel when I was six months old, and, and they were there studying and working for about six months. So I was all of a year old when we came home to Philadelphia at the time, uh, and I have no recollection of any of it. My parents have very vivid recollections. My parents actually met at a left-wing Zionist camp, um, and, uh, and they were uh, married... Uh, both as very young people and their, their dream was to uh, go to the then newly um, recognized and newly independent state of Israel and my father uh, the last 20 years of his life was able to realize his dream of actually going to Israel and, and to live uh, he, uh, he lived there almost 20 full years and uh, built a business there and, uh, and is buried in Jerusalem. And my brother Jonathan has now been in Israel 22 years. Um, his children are Israeli and his uh, three new grandchildren, uh, my oldest nephew, who is now 25, uh, Momo, uh, got married a couple of years ago and he and his wife have just been blessed with triplets, all of whom are uh, healthy and, and doing well, adding to the, uh, the Jewish population boom, which is something that most people don't know about the state of Israel, but is directly relevant to what we want to talk about. There are a lot of misunderstandings about, about Israel. First of all, how many people have, have um, been to Israel, have visited? Okay, well... So it's a, a, a not quite a majority of the, of the group that we have here. I think that there are a lot of things that shock people when they go to Israel for the first time. And I would like to encourage people. We're going in May, and we, we take a wonderful group of people, and we would, of course, love to have any other participants from Seattle come join us. But the, the three most prominent ideas um, that I think are just deeply mistaken about Israel have to do first of all with the notion that somehow the issue of Israel and Israeli security and Israel's existence and particularly the issue of the settlement is at the very heart of turmoil in the Middle East and we've heard this from the President of the United States that there can be no progress towards stability in the region unless the issue of the dispute between the Israelis and the Palestinians is settled. That's number one. Lie number two has to do with the notion that Israel is somehow a usurper state that uh, took the place of a long-flourishing Palestinian nation and that uh, somehow the attempt to reestablish the nation of Palestine is similar or analogous to, for instance, the uh, attempt to create uh, an, an independent um, uh, Montenegro uh, as a, from the old Yugoslavia, or uh, to establish Irish independence, uh, which is an analogy that is sometimes used. And the third idea, which is an idea that is advanced very frequently by people who are great supporters of the state of Israel, but is a deeply mistaken idea, is that Israel is somehow a compensatory policy or entity that was supported by the world community because of the incalculable suffering 
of the Jewish people in the Holocaust. And that somehow Israel arose like a phoenix from the ashes of the Holocaust. None of these things are true. Let me explain to you why and why it matters. Okay, on, on the first issue, the idea that, um, that, that somehow uh, the state of Israel is at the center of turmoil in the Middle East and is the true root cause of why the United States got involved in the Iraq War, why terrorists hate the United States, uh, the entire opposition that uh, the Islamic extremists have for our country. This is an idea that is very convenient for people who want to sort of realize H.L. Mencken's uh, wonderful maxim is that every complex problem has a solution that is neat, elegant, simple, and wrong. And uh, the, the idea that Israel is at the heart of this dispute is neat, elegant, simple, and wrong. And by the way, we, we actually ran experiments on this. The world community did. How? People may not recall, but a Nobel Peace Prize was handed out to Yasser Arafat and to now President of Israel, Shimon Peres, and to the late Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, for having made peace. There was a two-state solution. It was agreed upon in the Oslo Accords of 1993. You may remember there's that great moment where Bill Clinton, there's a famous photo as Bill Clinton's holding his arms like this, which always made made me think of, uh, actually it made me think of the image of Jesus at the uh, end of the football field at Notre Dame. Uh, The famous touchdown Jesus where um, uh, President Clinton is deploying his messianic powers and there in front of him are two little guys, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat and they're shaking hands and peace was made and every Nobel Prize is all around. And that didn't work out so well. Now, why didn't it work out so well? Because the idea that somehow Arab hostility to the West was based upon uh, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute has never been true. That Arab hostility long preceded, long preceded any Zionist movement or any Jewish settlement in or resettlement in the ancestral home. And as a matter of fact, the incidence of terrorism increased after Oslo, which is why it was that Nobel Prize winner Shimon Peres, who became prime minister in, uh, after, after Yitzhak Rabin was tragically and, and criminally assassinated, you may remember that the only uh, Israeli prime minister ever uh, to, to be killed, Yitzhak Rabin, was, was killed by an extremist, Yigal Amir. And I was there in the midst of that campaign, and it was a fascinating campaign because Clinton had come in and given a very good speech at Rabin's funeral. And for people who are political junkies, you may, may remember that that was a, a, a very serious thing. They flew over, because Gingrich, the Speaker of the House at the time, he went to Rabin's funeral as well. And it was the fact that uh, Bill Clinton did not invite Speaker Gingrich up to the front of the plane to talk with him on the way back from Israel, which is a long flight, that Gingrich complained about it and said, we can have no agreement, and we're not going to... And there was that famous New York po- uh, Daily News cartoon of Gingrich in a diaper protest. Was terribly, all terribly unfair. That was Rabin's funeral. At the funeral, President Clinton uh, used his limited... Um, his limited Hebrew to say Shalom Haver farewell friend goodbye friend when he was burying the great Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin it was very moving so Shimon Peres who was running for election as Rabin's anointed successor had as his bumper sticker and in all his advertising Shalom Haver uh, goodbye friend and Bibi Netanyahu who was running against him had a, a, an answering um, slogan, which was Shalom Haverim, which means goodbye friends, to refer to the 500 people who had been murdered by Palestinian terrorists since the Oslo Accords were signed. The Oslo Accords did not reduce terrorism, they increased terrorism. And, and it, it was very dramatic. Think about what it meant to the United States of America is during the very time that Oslo was being negotiated, we had the first World Trade Center bombing. 
And this is at a time when the United States and Israel were recognizing the right to a Palestinian state and recognized the PLO. We had the first World Trade Center revival. We had the Kobar Towers. We had the USS Cole. And, and then we had September 11th. All of, all of which at a time when peace was flourishing. And you may remember that at the very end of the Clinton administration, they came so close with the second Camp David meetings to actually completing the, uh, the Oslo Accords and, and having a permanent status agreement where virtually everything by Clinton and then the Israeli Prime Minister, they had uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak at the time, but none of this prevented the upsurge of Palestinian terrorism. Now, thank God, and when you come to Israel, you will notice that Palestinian terrorism is at an all-time low. It is at an all-time low. And the numbers are, are shocking, frankly, because in 2003, there were 490 people who were killed in, in terrorism by the, by the Palestinians. 490 Israelis. Some of them uh, Muslim, by the way. Some of them Israeli Arabs. They're, Okay, terrible thing in a country of 7 million. Two years later, that number had gone from 490 to less than 50. Today, the number every year is less than 10. It's, it, it, now, how did this happen? Peace agreements? No. Uh, military action, building a security barrier, and uh, very clear Israeli determination not to give in to terror. The other examples of why the, the idea that somehow the uh, source of Islamic terror is Israeli intransigence has to do with both May of uh, 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 2005, I believe. No, 2005 was the disengagement, which is another perfect example. In 2005, Prime, then Prime Minister Sharon in Israel uh, basically tried to implement part of the Oslo Accords by forcibly removing 9,000 longtime Jewish residents from Gaza. And you may remember that Gaza, which is part of the Palestinian Authority and was under Palestinian Authority uh, uh, control, that the idea was, and, and by the way, I will, I will say it, my wife was right about this, my father was right about this, I should always listen to my wife and my father, I was wrong, my brother was divided on it, as many Israelis were. But one of the biggest and most wrenching debates in Israel was, should we, as Israelis, forcibly remove 9,000 Israelis from their homes in Gaza, in order to give the Palestinians a, a bit of territory where they can begin to construct their state and where, after all, they are the overwhelming majority and allow the PLO to show its peaceful intentions. And the majority of Israelis felt that they should. The right-wing government of Prime Minister Sharon felt that they should. It was done despite great protests from uh, people on the right. And the rocket attacks began almost immediately. And there have to date been now 9,000 9,000 rockets that have struck Israel from Gaza. So the notion that somehow the, the way to curb terrorism, that the center of the terrorism struggle is uh, the existence of the state of Israel is, is completely unprovable. But by the way, the same thing is also true. It was 99 when Ehud Barak, then prime minister, uh, withdrew Israeli forces from southern Lebanon. And, and again, all in the interests of peace. Uh, it, it, the Israelis had, had fought a war with Lebanon to try to curb terror against Israel back in 1982. They had maintained an alliance with Lebanese Christians who were under terrible pressure there by the extremists in, in Lebanon. And they then withdrew, and uh, the, the results were immediate attacks, immediate rocket salvos, nothing like the peaceful coexistence that the world has promised would, would occur if Israel only withdrew. In other words, every time there have been major concessions for peace, every time, the result has been more terror, not less. And, and this is one of those points that it seems to me is historically inarguable. You can see it on the ground if you come to Israel. But it, it, is, it is very, very directly and incontestably the case the other thing is to try a thought experiment. Is try to imagine that um, uh, that either Barack Obama, President Obama, received his wish, or that, God forbid, a thousand times, 
Khalid Mashal, the leader of Hamas, received his wish. They're different wishes. President Obama would like to see a comprehensive peace settlement with what now is very close to 500,000 residents of Jewish communities in disputed territory, vacated from their homes, probably forcibly removed, and, uh, and, and a new flourishing Palestinian state. And try, try to imagine all of that happens. It's all negotiated, sealed by the UN. Some more Nobel Peace Prizes are sent out to go with the wonderful Peace Prize to Jimmy Carter and to Al Gore, uh, which is still... And President Obama. Um, I, I'm at a, I think Senator Gordon, it's about time to put Senator Gordon up for a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Um, though it's, it's probably too devalued for, uh, for, for Senator Gordon. But in any event... Everybody's got him now. Yeah, exactly. Come on. No, it, it, it is, it is re- remarkable. It's, it's one of those things we'll have to explain to our children how it was that President Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize before he became president. It must have been his work as a community organizer. Um, in any event... Uh, okay, so let's say all of this happens, and a Nobel, new Nobel Peace Prizes are given out for the people who negotiate this final peace settlement. And does anyone believe that Iran will say, oh, fine, we drop our nuclear ambitions? Does anyone believe that the pressure and the, and the, and the, and the, the conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, between Shia and Sunni, which has been age-old in the region, that that pressure would be in any way reduced or dissipated? that all of a sudden the Muslim Brotherhood, which is empowered in Egypt and increasingly empowered, would drop its prosecution of 16 innocent Americans, for which they're willing to risk a billion dollars in USA. The entire thing, or that in Yemen, or that in Syria, in, in Syria they are very close to a situation now, they've way past the situation, more Syrians have died at the hands of uh, this Bashar al-Assad regime, not then his father, his father killed still more, because his father killed 20,000 in Hama alone, but more Syrians have died at the hands of Bashar al-Assad than in all of Syria's wars and conflicts with Israel combined, and by a factor of at least five to one. And it's remarkable that the world pays them. Now, would Syria suddenly become... You've settled the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And, this is not to mention Pakistan, would all of a sudden the Pakistan nuclear capacity be in safe hands? Or the situation in Afghanistan, which is spiraling so tragically out of control? Does any sane human being honestly believe the garbage that is put out regularly by media and by some of our political leaders that somehow peace between Israel and the Palestinians is going to create a utopian, peaceful, stable, democratic world in the Islamic world. It's madness because it makes no difference. The existence of the state of Israel has meant nothing, nothing in negative terms, for instance, to Iranians. How, how have Iranians suffered from the state of Israel? In fact, Israel was, and you could say, well, Israel was a great ally of the Shah. And that's true. But basically, in terms of part of the cooperation between Israel and the old Iranian regime, there was Iranian help, uh, Israeli help, there was Iranian help in terms of oil supplies to Israel, and all kinds of Israeli help with social issues and hospitals and schools and other things. And there were friendly relations. It is very difficult to think of any Iranian other than a committed terrorist who's thrown in his lot with Hezbollah, which is a client of the Iranians, who has suffered because of Israel or Israel's existence. And I mentioned that we should think, play a thought experiment running through both Barack Obama's dream and Khalid Mashal's dream, the leader of Hamas. Khalid Mashal's dream, or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad Wachshab's dream, is of course that that Israel magically disappears. Or maybe not so magically. Israel is vaporized in some kind of Iranian nuclear attack. Or let's say it's much neater than that. That uh, uh, Ahmadinejad has said repeatedly that he wants all the Jews in Israel to go back to Germany. We'll get to that in the third bit. But let, let's say that happened. Everybody vacates. It, 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 the people, the Jewish people, the 7 million close to Jews who live in the state of Israel, Uh, are are suddenly transported somewhere else, either forcibly or through choice. What changes? 
for the nation of Iran? What improvement is there for the nation of Egypt, for Libya, for Tunisia? You could argue that, well, of course, that there would be that Egypt has fought several wars with Israel. Egypt is more directly involved in Egypt or Iraq. I mean, Iraq lobbed 39 missiles during the Gulf War at Israel. Israel was not involved in the coalition because President George Herbert Walker Bush did not want Israel involved in the coalition. And the, the idea that somehow there would be an improvement for any Arab or any Muslim outside of the immediate vicinity is a fantasy. So this notion that somehow the settlements in particular and the existence of Israel in general is the chief irritant that has created uh, unrest in the Islamic world. Uh, unrest exists in the Islamic world since the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. There has been very little other than unrest in the Islamic world. And that's a, a point for further discussion. The second point has to do with and this, the, the notion that, um, that it, Israel was a replacement somehow of a flourishing Palestinian state. And, and when people say this, I, I say, but what Palestinian state? The, the only time there has ever been the service of Jerusalem, for instance, as a capital city, it has been of a Jewish commonwealth. Jerusalem has never been a capital city in the Arab world, despite the claims that uh, Jerusalem is, is actually uh, somehow the third holiest city in Islam. You will not find that anywhere. And, and by the way, there is a, 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 a publication that a friend of mine showed me, 1922, the Waqf which is the Islamic religious authorities who monitor the holy sites on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, including the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Waqf published in 1922 this document, which was welcoming tourists at the time, pilgrims, to the holy sites in Jerusalem. And they mentioned at the time that this is the holy site of the uh, Jewish temple, and this is a sacred site to us because we also revere King Solomon who consecrated this site. Nothing about the Mosque of Omar, nothing about... Jerusalem. That, that was their basis for considering Jerusalem al-Quds, the holy. Uh, Jerusalem is mentioned more than 700 times in Hebrew scripture. It is mentioned never in the Quran. In the Hadith, it is mentioned occasionally as al-Quds, the holy, but never in the Quran. And because Muhammad never went there. I mean, excuse me, he went there in a, on the Iskra, and the night dream that he had, uh, a vision where he went up to the seven heavens and he met with Abraham and Jesus and others. But uh, that's the, uh, and, and that's Hadith, it's not in the Quran. Jerusalem never mentioned. The, the, the point being about this, that uh, this came up in a, uh, uh, there was a piece in the Seattle Times, and I remember, I think it was 1997 or 98, and, and a piece about, uh, isn't it about time that, uh, that the world recognized the nation of Palestine because it had such a long and honorable history. And they then mentioned, um, you know, the great Palestinian contributions to civilization. Now, they, the only Palestinian that they mentioned making great contributions to civilization before the 20th century was Salah Dim, Saladin, who was not Palestinian. He's Kurdish. He's a Kurd. He never even lived in the area of Jerusalem or what later became Israel. And they also mentioned the, uh, Yasser Arafat and uh, Dr. Uh, Al-Rintisi, who was then the head of Hamas and uh, as some of the great Palestinian contributions to civilization. Much more basic challenge. Not challenge anyone here or anyone anywhere. And this is, by the way, the best way to win this argument. Ask anyone who talks about the great and noble history of Palestine and the Palestinian people to identify a famous Palestinian. I mean, seriously, it's, it's, it should be possible for such an ancient people, right? I mean, if you're asked to identify famous Irish people, well, of course, St. Patrick is, a, is, is tough because he is actually a Briton originally. <laughs> but uh, but, but there, there, there are plenty, plenty of others. Right? And Scotch people, of course, plenty of others going back. Famous Palestinian? 
most famous prime minister of Palestine, most famous king of Palestine, viceroy. No, no, because there was there was no king of Palestine, there was no viceroy of Palestine, there was no prime minister of Palestine, there was no Palestine. It was never, ever, ever, even a a district, even a subsidiary independent district within a larger empire except as a Jewish commonwealth where it flourished and existed for more than a thousand years and, uh, and, and considerably more than a thousand years. The, the history of this particular land as any kind of indigenous civilization was always Jewish. And, and this is why Speaker Gingrich, God bless him, he got a tremendous amount of gas for saying <coughs> Palestinians don't exist, they're not a real people. Okay, it exists as a construct, but it is a very recent construct. When people use the term Palestinian, or when you look up, for instance, somebody sent me a copy of World Book from 1940, 30, 39 or 40. And the World Book, they had a big article about Palestine. It was all about Israel. I mean, basically, because they used to call the... Uh, and, and do people know the origins of the term Palestine? Okay, the origins of the per- term Palestine is, is quite fascinating. When the Romans destroyed the Second Temple, and, and they were done messing with Jews because they lost two whole Roman legions, and they had the, the history of the, the great Jewish revolt from 66 AD to 70 AD when the Temple was destroyed. It's, it's a phenomenal history, and, and Josephus, who's the main source, Flavius Josephus of that history, is, is very well regarded. In any event, he reports it, and most historians have confirmed there were a million Jews who were slaughtered at the time. It was about a third of the total population of Judea at the time. And the the Romans were so furious about the the lengthy process of subjugating these people that they were determined that never again would this happen. So they changed the name Jerusalem. They called it Aeolia Capitolina. They destroyed the temple, leveled it, actually uh, sowed the temple mount with salt so nothing could ever grow there, no trees, no anything. They installed a big statue of Jupiter there, and they changed the name of that province of the Roman Empire uh, from uh, Judea Judea, to uh, Palestina, which they took the name of the Philistines, who were the traditional enemies of the Jewish people, as an insult. Now... Was there any connection with indigenous populations of the Philistines? No, the Philistines were related to uh, people from Tyre, right? They they think they were related to Carthaginians, but they don't really know because the uh, Philistines were lost to history and ceased to exist about 500 years before the name Palestine was given. There is zero ethnographic or any other historical connection between the Philistines and Palestinians. Palestinians are Arabs. And they can trace the DNA people who do all this. They can trace them to the Arabian Peninsula. That's who they are. They're Arabs. And they were always indistinguishable from Arabs in Syria and Egypt. Yasser Arafat did not grow up as a Palestinian because the term wasn't used. If the term was used at any time when he was growing up, he was born in Egypt and educated in Kuwait. And uh, if the term Palestinian was used, it applied to the Jewish settlers who were then in the process of building a Jewish state. And speaking of which, one of the other aspects of this belief that somehow uh, the state of Israel replaced this noble heritage of Palestine, I, I just, I, I, this is so dramatic and it's so, and this is, this is based upon British imperial figures, which are pretty good. The, the, the Brits have always been pretty good at taking censuses and computing numbers. Between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II, the Jewish population and what later became the state of Israel increased by 470,000, most of it through immigration. Despite the fact that the immigration was stopped by the famous white paper in order to sue the Palestinian population at the time, the Arab population at the time, there was an increase of 470,000. In that same area, this covering the entire area from the Jordan to the sea, where Jews were 
building communities as part of the Zionist movement, the Arab population increased at the same time by 588,000. What a difference. 470,000. Now, why is that important? Because the legend is Jews came in, drove Palestinians from their land, took over Palestinian land. It's quite the contrary. Jews came in and created economic activity, changed the whole dynamic, and Arabs moved in largely from Egypt and Syria, but frankly from the entire Arab world because there was economic activity there and because there was a rising standard of living. And by the way, in the 37 years from 1926, um, I'm sorry, between 1926 and 1943, Muslim life expectancy, as measured by the Brits in their rather obsessive census taking, Muslim life expectancy in 1926 was measured at 37 years. By 1943, it had risen to 49 years. Infant mortality declined in that same period from 201 per thousand to 94 per thousand. Why? Because all of a sudden you had Zionist settlers who were building hospitals and providing clinics and of course taking Arab patients and improving the water supply and improving the food supply and you have this burgeoning Palestinian population In other words, far from driving Palestinians from their homes, according to the commonly held and embraced myth, the Zionist settlement of the ancient homeland resulted in a huge accretion and increase in the Arab population of the region, including many of the families that are most prominently figuring in some of the Palestinian nationalism that later emerged. One other thing, people talk about the settlements giving rise to the Palestinian movement. The Palestine Liberation Organization, which was really the first time that there was some kind of recognition by the other Arab states. And remember that everything that they claim should be the foundations of the new state of Palestine, namely Gaza, the entire West Bank, and all of East Jerusalem, was under Arab control from 1949 to 1967. Undisputed Arab control. It was part of Jordan. The reason they call it the West Bank, has it ever occurred to you that the term West Bank is kind of peculiar? Mm -hmm. Right, it is. Why is it the West Bank? Because it was a Jordanian province. It was part of Jordan. Most of Jordan was on the East Bank of the river. The West Bank was the West Bank of the river, but that was part of Jordan and recognized as such. And the the idea that there was no move to create this separate Palestinian entity is because there was no separate Palestinian identity. That was created beginning in 1965, before the June War, in 1965 by the organization of the PLO, which was initially headed by a a dismal uh, gentleman named Ahmed Shukeri, who uh, was a a disciple of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who uh, we don't need to go into here or right now. But in any event, the the idea that there was somehow a a, a flourishing Palestinian state, entity, proto-state, anything that was displaced by a usurper state called Israel is a great fiction and and one that, that does tremendous, tremendous damage to people who try to look fairly and dispassionately at this ongoing struggle. That seems to be the final point. And I, I know I'm taking too long, and I'll try to uh, get, get to it here. Um, the, the final point has to do with this association of Israel and uh, the, the Holocaust. And this is it's an emotional thing, because there are Israelis, though, thank God, increasingly few Israelis, who will affirm this connection. And, and, and they, for instance, they, they will often in the Israeli calendar, you have Yom HaShoah, which is the day of the Shoah, the Holocaust, Holocaust Remembrance Day, is followed by Yom HaTzma'ut, which is the Israeli Independence Day. And that, of course, encourages this notion that somehow uh, there was this terrible, terrible calamity for the Jewish people in uh, which the majority of the European Jewish population was killed and that was followed by the survivors streaming to the state of Israel 
and creating this wonderful reborn state. It's a lovely story. It has absolutely no connection to the truth. And it's important that we understand that. Why is it important? Because when people like Ahmadinejad and, and frankly, people like Congressman Paul uh, try to make the case that the right thing for the Jews of the Middle East would be to return to Europe, uh, Congressman Paul, you may not realize it, is a, a temple denier. He does not believe there was a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. How do I know? Read his book. His most recent book is called Liberty Defined. Chapter 20, the final chapter, is about Zionism and his view of Zionism. And he believes Zionism is a gigantic fraud, which is based on this mistaken idea that there is this long-standing Jewish presence in what later became Israel. He uh, cites in the book figures from a Palestinian historian who says that, uh, that the Arabs have controlled um, the uh, city of Jerusalem for more than 1,600 years and Jews for only a total of less than 170 years. Now, that means that King David didn't exist and King Solomon didn't exist and there was no first temple and there was no second temple. It's madness, but we'll leave that aside for just a moment. Um, the, the point about the association with the Holocaust and with Israel is if you believe that Israel was somehow that the world felt so guilty because all these innocent people were killed. And the world decided, you know what, it's about time. Let's give them a homeland. Uh, uh, then you have an argument saying, wait a minute, why are you giving them a homeland with Arab territory? Why not give them a homeland in Germany? Germany did the crime. Why not give them a homeland, homeland back in Poland? So where they lived for hundreds of years. The Poles collaborated. This, this is a, a major theme of anti-Semites around the world. And it was a major theme of the... Uh, the Holocaust Denial Conference, which is, is, is terrific. It's, it's wonderful. The Holocaust Denial Conference, which I followed very closely and tried to cover on the air, uh, David Duke participated representing the United States and sort of, though he's living in Russia, more power to him. Um, in any event, David Duke participated in this conference in Tehran. And in the same impassioned two-and-a-half-hour speech, President Ahmadinejad spoke to this group and said the Holocaust absolutely didn't happen, and Hitler didn't kill anybody, but Hitler didn't kill enough of them. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's a, a certain internal contradiction there, but it's... I, I, uh, um, I, I also... I, there's a famous Dry Bones... Kishon, a famous Israeli cartoonist, does this Dry Bones cartoon. He did a famous Dry Bones cartoon where it, um, um, it, it shows President Ahmadinejad waving a finger and saying, we will wipe Israel off the map. And then it shows an aide pulling on his sleeve and saying, but Mr. President, we don't have Israel on our maps. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't. Um, in any event, the, the Israel did not grow up as a refuge for Holocaust survivors. Simply not true. And, and it did not grow up from people fleeing the Holocaust. My grandparents fled, fled the Holocaust. My, my mother was born in Germany and came to this country when she was nine years old in 1934 with my grandparents. Uh, they fled the Holocaust. They, they um, were very interested in coming to the United States. It was very hard to go anywhere. But people who fled the Holocaust before did not come to this. Why not? Answer, because there was a British white paper and the British restricted immigration and completely stopped Jewish immigration before the war. And throughout the war, despite the fact that they were fighting the Nazis, they made it virtually impossible for Jews to come to the Middle East. Now, why? Was it because they were bad guys? They weren't bad guys. They, they, were, they were concerned. And by the way, one of the big thrusts of Rommel at El Alamein in the North Africa campaign was to sweep over and to destroy what then already was a Jewish community. Now, I just gave you the numbers. They had nearly 600,000 Jewish people living in what later became the state of Israel before the war. After the war, the white paper remained in force. Some of you may remember the old movie and novel Exodus. It was virtually impossible for Jewish people to get to Israel. Even people who had lost everything. Even people who were in DP camps, displaced persons camps. Israel built up as a result of literally a hundred years of Zionist planning, 
effort, dreams, and sanctioned by the world community long before anyone had heard of Adolf Hitler. The League of Nations, which was, of course, the predecessor to the United, United Nations, the League of Nations authorized a Jewish homeland in the ancient territory of Judea in 1923. Same year as the Beer Holt Pitch, so Hitler was kind of nothing and nobody. It was not in response to the Holocaust. Now, you can say that the Holocaust confirmed Herzl's basic point. Herzl, the fascinating figure who was the founding father of modern Zionism, who was a largely assimilated, predominantly secular, though later in his life he became more interested in, in, in Judaism as a, as a faith. Theodor Herzl, Benjamin Zev Herzl, um, was a, a drama critic and a bon vivant and a journalist and a novelist and, and somebody who was a, a very secularized, a German-speaking intellectual in Vienna and came up with this actual dream that, and, and the slogan for the Zionist movement was if you dream it, it's no fairy tale. In Tirtsu lo Agatha. If you dream it, it's no fairy tale, it's no story, it's not made up. Referring to the fact that, that for years and years and years, Jewish people have been talking about a return to the ancient home. And that he believed that it could be possible. The settlement began before Herzl. There were early settlements in, in places like Rishon Lutzion with dreams of people like Baron Rothschild. And the settlement really began in the 1880s and then became a flood after World War I. And that's when you have the 477,000 new Jews moving to the Middle East before the Holocaust. It wasn't the Holocaust that did it. Israel existed. That's why I always hate the idea that the UN created the State of Israel. The UN recognized the State of Israel. There were functioning universities, a very well-functioning army, thank you very much, despite the fact that there was a weapons embargo for the whole world. Newspapers, community organizations, political parties. Political parties in Israel are, whatever you want to complain about political parties in the U.S., and there's plenty to complain about, political parties in Israel is crazy because it's, it's, it's really your whole, there's social clubs, insurance companies. I mean, you, you get everything through your political party, and, and there are really far too many of them. There are 120 seats in the Knesset, and they represent, I believe, at last count, it's 24 or 25 different parties. And uh, it, it's, it's, there has never, ever been a majority government. Even Ben-Gurion, the, the George Washington of Israel, the founding prime minister, could never get a majority because the whole thing is fractured into these crazy parties. The, the Green Leaf Party in the last election, which is the marijuana party in Israel, has a seat in the Knesset. And they have a pensioner's party that now has three Knesset seats. Uh, they have the Arab Communist Party has five seats now in Knesset. They're charming. Um, and um, in any event, it's, it's, it's a vibrant democracy. But all of this pre-existed recognition by the United Nations. So buying this deal that somehow the world community came in and said poor baby and by the way the notion that the United States helped create Israel there was an arms embargo which Truman ruthlessly enforced the arms that Israel used to win independence came primarily anyone know? from Czechoslovakia yeah it, it was from Czechoslovakia because they had a they, they had a Slonsky regime in, in, the, the, in Czechoslovakia before but but largely they, they did it without I mean there are there are stories about the battle at Latrun salient where one of the most important victories in the war for independence occurred where they actually took the position with phony guns that they had carved out of wood because they didn't have real guns and they were and, and these guys were rushing into very real guns and machine gun emplacements only holding pieces of wood that were painted and made to look like real guns so that they could... And it, look, it, all of this is, is nonsense. In 1917, the British Empire, which controlled that part of the world, issued the Balfour Declaration, which said His Majesty's government will look with favor to the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. 
confirmed by the League of Nations 1923, and all before the resolution for partition passed the UN in 1947, and then the recognition of the State of Israel in May of 1948. All of this is important to know. And I, I, I make these three basic points because the, the lies behind them are so ubiquitous and so difficult and so toxic. And with that, having rambled on a little bit too discursively and too long, please let me turn it over to Senator Gorton for questions and comments. Just, I have one more question to bring it up today. Did the President's uh, speech at uh, APAC yeah, a, a month or so ago and uh, his tougher language mean anything? What's going to happen for the rest of the year before the election? Well, I, I think what it meant was that President Obama, because of what happened in the Ninth District in New York, where the most Jewish district in the country, for the first time ever, elected a Republican, <coughs> Bob Turner. Now, of course, the state legislature has now eliminated that district. So <laughs> Congressman Turner is running for Senate. No, against the courts did. The legislature oh. failed. Oh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You're right. Of course. Um, but... Uh, I think what the speech meant is that not only one thing, President Obama was worried about winning the Jewish votes he needs to uh, carry the state of Florida, uh, and uh, which is obviously very crucial to his hopes for re-election. And uh, Jewish voters uh, can be and will be very important in the state of Ohio um, and, and elsewhere. The president's concerned about it. I don't think he's concerned about the many Jewish voters in the state of New York or California, which I think are probably very likely to support the president. But now I talk in political terms because in, in policy terms, people that I trust in primarily my brother, I mean, I trust my brother more than anybody else, but my brother is very involved in Israeli politics and business, and he is um, a personal friend of the prime minister. And uh, on first name basis, but then again, everyone on Israel is on first name basis with everybody. <laughs> I mean, people, it's no Mr. Prime Minister, Bibi, Bibi. <laughs> uh, here's the question, and, and I don't know the answer to this, maybe you, you do. Um, did the president give the prime minister assurance? that if the window of opportunity closes for Israel to do meaningful damage to the Iranian nuclear facilities, that the United States will take care of it. And some people believe the President made those assurances privately. I don't believe that he did, and I also believe that even if he did, <laughs> I think it's, it's dubious. Uh, and, and today, there, there was in the New York Times and elsewhere, um, the, uh, our intelligence community just released the results of this war game, which is, uh, why is that being released to the public? And if they, they war gamed what would happen if Israel took out the Iranian nuclear facility. And it clearly is meant to discourage the Israelis because it plays out uh, a war game which would result, they say, according to this computer model, in the Iranians sinking some American ship and killing at least 200 American sailors. So basically the way the Israeli press is responding is the Americans are saying, uh, if we have uh, dead servicemen, it'll be on your hands. And um, I, I honestly believe that from what I understand of the president and, and Senator Gordon, I'm sure you know him much, much better than I do, but that his sole concern for the next several months is winning re-election. And he just wants nothing to happen to derail that or to derail the economic recovery between now and November. Would his attitude be different if he were re-elected? Well, I fear that it would be, it would be going back to the, the bad old Obama from last year uh, who, who took this lunatic position. And, and, and again... There is no support for this position, even on the far left in Israel. President Obama took a unique position that no prior president or secretary of state or Palestinian president had ever taken, which is we can only negotiate, there can only be negotiations if there's a settlement freeze. When they negotiated Oslo, there was no settlement freeze. 
Israel was actively building. This idea that there must be a settlement freeze or you can't even talk about peace is pure Obama. And it's a novel idea. And it's a crazy idea. And by the way, BB, the Prime Minister, they had a complete settlement freeze for 10 months. No negotiations. So, um, I, yes, I, I, I greatly fear that a re-elected president would see as the great legacy of his second term a, an imposed peace, um, which I don't think will go well. Open. I have two questions. First is, were you in red diapers? Is that what I heard? No, not, not close, close to it. My parents were members of a group called Hashomer Hatzair, which means the Young Guard, uh, which was a an anti-Stalinist um, lefty. Le, le, yeah, it was basically a Trotskyite group. So, uh, but my dad, my dad left that, thank God, early enough so that he had the highest security clearance when he worked here in the d- defense industry. He. You know, he obviously had to leave that nonsense behind. My, I'll tell you how, how bad it was for my parents. They, they both worked the one political campaign in which they were uh, most active uh, before my, my dad joined the rest of the family in uh, uh, supporting President Reagan. And, but the one campaign was what my parents, may they rest in peace, were most active was Henry Wallace's presidential campaign in 1948, which was basically a commie front. Operation, um, and uh, won a uh, like so many other third-party campaigns. It was a smashing success. They won almost two percent of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> and my second question, um, a little more serious, is uh, I think I heard from you perhaps that uh, there's only two percent of uh, in the. If you look at the uh, Middle East, a hundred years ago, it was twenty-five percent non-Islam Muslim. And now it's less than two percent. Uh, yeah, it's. I don't know what the actual numbers are, but they they do um, the, the percentage. I, I, I know that, for instance, in Bethlehem and Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem was always. I mean, always from the time of Jesus, a a majority Christian city. Yeah, and and now the they they estimate the Christian population of Bethlehem is below ten percent. Do they count Egypt in that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, they, they, the, the claim that 10% of Egypt is Coptic is way out of date. It's just like they claim that 40% of Lebanon is Christian, and it isn't. It's maybe 20% now. Basically, Christians have been driven out of the Middle East. There was the declaration today by the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, which I discussed on the air. That was my third hour on the air today. It's, it's an unbelievable thing. The Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia issued a fatwa saying there is a religious ob- obligation to destroy all churches in the region. In the region. Now, there are no churches in Saudi Arabia. Not permitted. And their, their, their position has been that if uh, and they have a million and a half Catholics living in Saudi Arabia. Registered Catholics. They're mostly Filipino workers. And they are not allowed to take public sacraments anywhere, which is kind of serious if you're a serious Catholic. Because churches are now try to imagine if the if the chief rabbi of Israel or, or the Pope, right? The Pope proclaimed that we have a religious obligation to clear all mosques out of Italy. <laughs> Can you imagine the reaction? And the reaction from the president was this wonderful message he sent to the people of Iran today, wishing them happy Nowruz, which is Zoroastrian New Year. And it's a, a long message about the historic friendship between the people of America and the people of Iran. LOL. Uh, Susan. Uh, I have not been to Israel. Come with us. I would love to. <laughs> uh, unless, unless you're otherwise engaged in May. <laughs> um, I have uh, connections to Christian college professors. Uh, smart, um, well-read well-traveled individuals who are committed Christians who despise the Israeli government, mm-hmm. who talk about the, the wall or the fence or the security points as degrading to the Palestinians and um, racist and etc., etc. Um, 
they're vehemently opposed to Jewish people being in Israel and having an Israel, a state of Israel. Where are they wrong, and how did they get this idea, um, and how insulting and degrading are these security checkpoints? Uh, security checkpoints are annoying. Uh, they're annoying for anyone to go through. Um, and by the way, they're, they're much less. And they've, I'm annoyed by the TSA every time I, I do that. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, glad, I'm glad that they do it. Uh, the, the, the real problem, just on the security checkpoints, I want to go back to the more substantive questions in a moment. The real problem is this, that before the intifada, Literally, and I know this because both my, my father and my brother were in business in Jerusalem. Before the Intifada, there were over a million, a million Palestinians who came into Israel every day to work. And it was a major source of wealth. If you look at the, the economic progress that was made by the Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza during the period between 1967 and in 1993, when it was handed over to the Palestinian Authority, the economic progress was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. The growth rate in Palestinian territories was greater than in Israel. In Israel, it, it's been averaging about 8% a year. But in any event, the, uh, the, the, the problem is that that, that that million people who came over, because it's all very close. It's all, I mean, it, you know, driving from Jericho to Jerusalem is like driving to Bellevue from here. I mean, it's, it's close. And you go right up the hill from Jericho and you're in Jerusalem. And Jericho was originally before Ramallah, the capital of the Palestinian Authority. And, and people used to come all the time. My dad had in his company um, three wonderful Palestinian workers. Now, once the Intifada started, it was impossible. Because literally, you had people dying every day. You're talking about a country of 7 million total and 500 people nearly killed in one year by terror, including the 30 people who were blown up at that Passover Seder. Um, it was appalling. And, they, and that's, that's the security. And, and Bibi says it very well. The Prime Minister says, Israel didn't build a wall. The security barrier, they call it. Israel didn't build it. Terror built it. And it's absolutely true. I mean, nobody nobody likes it. Nobody wants it. Uh, but it has worked. It has reduced terrorism to just about zero. It's not because of peace settlements. It's because of extraordinarily good military intelligence and people on the ground in in the West Bank, not in Gaza, but and, and also for uh, security and protection. So where is he wrong about... The, the, the question here would be, consider what existed in the Middle East before Jewish people returned to their ancient home. And just to give you one example, the population of Jerusalem, they did a census uh, in, when it was still in, in the, under Ottoman control in 1840. The population of the city of Jerusalem in 1840 was less than 20,000, with a plurality of Jews, more Jews than uh, than either Christians or Muslims. Uh, it had gone up in by 1914, the last Ottoman census. It had gone up to 25,000, with a majority of Jews in Jerusalem. Jerusalem today, when you go there, you'll see it is a beautiful city where people live very well. It's very high standard of living. Ben Yehuda Street is one of the great nightlife places where people uh, like to go. Our son, during his year in Israel, spent too much time on Ben Yehuda Street. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a city of 800,000. The Palestinian population of Jerusalem has vastly increased and lives better than any other urban population anywhere in the Arab world. With, with more political rights, more economic rights. And by the way, and here's the, the proof against your professors. And what, uh, part of what, what that has to do with is um, that, that before a Palestinian, there are now more Palestinian Christians in Chicago than in any 
city in the Middle East. Well, there are a lot of them. And, and the, the Christian population has been decimated, not by any kinds of pogroms or anything like that, but because they've left, because they've been attacked by Muslims. And Beit Jala, which is a neighborhood right near a Jewish neighborhood called Gilo, Beit, which was a very high-end Christian neighborhood outside of Beit Lechem, outside of Bethlehem. Um, the Palestinians, uh, Muslims, jihadists came in and... Uh, and killed children took over these homes so they could shoot at the Jewish homes they were very nice homes for Christian Palestinians in any event um, if you look at the growth and the development and the living standards and even in Gaza living standards life expectancy gross domestic product per capita every measure Gaza is better off than Egypt and one of the things they're worried about, about the, the you know, security between Gaza and Egypt, is Egyptians flooding Gaza. They have shopping centers there. It's, it's not what you think. And, and by the way, when, when you go on our trip with us, we go to the West Bank and we look at the Israeli communities and we look at the Palestinian communities in the West Bank. And uh, it, it, is, it is not at all what the way it is portrayed in media. So why do they, they, you know, these college professors are, are Christian left. Right. They're not Christian right. Right, of course. So so why is it that they, um, what is the divide? What, why are there those who who love Bibi Netanyahu and others who despise him in our American Christian population? What is the divide? Well, it's, it's largely a divide between... Um, the National Council of Churches. Na- National Council of Churches, well, pardon me, has been anti-Israel forever. I mean, from the very beginning. And what's interesting about this is liberal Jewish denominations also used to be anti-Zionist. The Reform Movement in Judaism, which is now proudly Zionist, uh, was decidedly anti-Zionist. There's a group that's still kicking around. You can you can find it. It's called the American Council for Judaism, run by a Reform rabbi named Elmer Berger uh, which has always been opposed to the state of Israel and one of, the, one of the things for people on the left, and you know this because you know them um, people on the left don't believe in nationalism right? they don't believe that the idea of having pride in and a sense of family about your own nation, having a separate flag and that by the way is, is one of the things, that, and you will see it when you come with us to Israel really um, there are only two countries in the world where ordinary people regularly, for no special occasion, where they fly the nation's flag. You know, it's one of the things that strikes... Uh, Josef Jaffe, who's a, a German editor, says what it always strikes him when he comes to the United States is he'll go to a gas station. Somebody will be flying the American flag. Israel's the same. They fly the Israeli flag everywhere. People are nationalistic. Zionism is a nationalistic movement. Now, it's a nationalistic movement infused with religious pride despite the fact that most Israelis are secular but I think the nationalistic aspect of the whole existence of the Jewish people and all of Jewish identity makes people on the Christian left and people on the left in general profoundly uncomfortable Uh, and I'm sure you will hear lots of choice words you'll pardon the expression about the chosen people Okay, and, and and by the way, that concept of the chosen people, the 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 best way to understand that, and that this is a whole other subject for a, another day, but I'll I'll do it very briefly. Amsigula, the it's the people of choice. It's the choosing people. In other words, the 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 idea of chosenness in Jewish tradition means special obligations, not special privileges. There are no privileges under Jewish law or Jewish tradition that Jewish people have that Gentiles don't. They had a special entrance on the temple for non-Jews to bring sacrifices. The temple in Jerusalem was not exclusive to Jews. Wasn't it, there were, deliberately, there were people of other nations who brought the only thing that's exclusive to Jews are obligations, some of which can be quite a pain when you're dealing with uh, major Jewish holidays on um, inconvenient days uh, when you're dealing with Passover we have coming up where you have to rid your house of beer and uh, other, other examples of leaven so, I, I don't know if that helps 
How would you characterize the relationship between the Prime Minister and President Obama? Prime Minister <laughs> Netanyahu and <laughs> President Obama. Um, I, I, I think it's somewhat similar to the all oh, the wonderfully warm and friendly relationships, say, between Senator Santorum and Governor Romney, uh, which is there's an understanding on one level that ultimately we're on the same side, but we hate each other's guts. Mm-hmm. And, and I really think it's the, the same kind of thing. And, and you know, I, I, I assume that Senator Santorum and Governor Romney will get together at some point for a higher common purpose, just like I believe the President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu. But th- these are two people, their personal chemistry. I mean, my wife is a clinical psychologist, but when you see the two of them together, the... Um, uh, and, and by the way, and, and, and in Israel, the, uh, you know, the President Obama, they, they do, they do uh, uh, there's a puller, the Israeli Gallup is a guy named Hanaf Smith who does Israeli polls. And, um, Obama set the all-time record for low approval rate. Arafat never had lower approval ratings in Israel than, <laughs> than because he got a high, high approval rating from Israeli Arabs. Um, but, but President Obama, including Israeli Arabs, 4% approval. Jim, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple weeks ago, 60 Minutes did a story on the cyber attacks on the uh, Iranian uh, uh, nuclear facility. And, uh, it's a really tragic mishap. Yeah. <laughs> so what was curious about they left open, whether it was uh, Israeli or American initiated. And do you have an opinion about the origin of that? I'm sure it's a topic of discussion in Israel. My sources in Israel have an opinion about it. Uh, they, they, they think it was homegrown, and they're extremely proud of it. Um, and, and look, I mean, there was also, I, I don't know how this could possibly have happened. They, they had this, um, uh, they were showing off this Iranian missile that was supposed to be used to, de- to deliver their nuclear weapon when they have it, and um, they were doing the te- first test firing. They had called the whole international press to see it, and I, I don't know if you recall this, it blew up. And, in the, and the head of the whole project was killed and 16 other top scientists. Mm-hmm. How could something like that happen? It's it's just a tragedy. Yeah, no, no, I mean, look, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I, I don't mean to make light of it because I have, um, I have two nephews now who are in the Israeli military. And um, one of them in a very, um, very high-risk military unit, a very elite unit. I'm very proud of uh, my nephews and my niece, and, and uh, but um, uh, this is one of those things. Here's an amazing thing that they uh, they recently um, asked for volunteers from the Israeli Air Force um, for a potential mission in Iran, and and this was actually um, uh, it was covered by the Israeli. They, they needed uh, 300 volunteers with the understanding that there was a very real possibility. The best guess is only one half or maybe at best two-thirds of them would return. This will not be an easy mission. This would not be... Uh, they needed 300 volunteers. They got over 1,000 volunteers from the Air Force. Uh, people are very, very serious about this. And... Um, and particularly in, in the military, and, and the military in Israel, this is this is one of those things that I, I mean I love. Uh, I don't know if anybody here knows the top-rated radio show in in Israel. I mean here in the United States we have Rush Limbaugh. God bless him; he should live and do well. Um, the top-rated radio show in Israel, and it's been the top-rated radio show for 30 years, is um, it's a, it's a show called. Kola Shelhima, which is uh, the voice of mommy, mommy's voice. And they do, it's four hours, it's extremely emotional and very schmaltzy, but it's Friday afternoon, Erev Shabbos, right before the Sabbath comes in. And they just have, uh, on broadcast, uh, young soldiers who are away from home for the Sabbath and and mothers uh, wishing their sons good Sabbath and the boys wishing back the mommy. That's it. That's, that's the radio show. And everybody listens to it. And everything stops it. 
you know, it's it's uh, so yeah. The military is kind of everybody, and and given the fact that almost everybody, both boys and girls, male, males and females, the military participation has slipped to some extent as a big thing, but it's a, it's a between seventy five and eighty percent. So it's it's still a lot different from the U.S. Should the extreme Orthodox be required <coughs> Absolute, to serve? Absolutely. And by the way, on, when they pull that in Israel, the majority Orthodox position, because most most Orthodox people in Israel, the, the, the country is about 30% to a third uh, religious observant, and the majority of those people are not Haredi. They are not people wearing black coats. They're people wearing kippahs or nit yamulka. And uh, the majority Orthodox position and in the country at large, 90%, 90% of the country believes that uh, all Jewish people should be required to serve. And by the way, one of the things that, that's happened recently, it's fascinating to read about, is it used to be that Arab Israelis were not allowed to serve in the military. That was the one thing that, and, and now they opened it up a couple of years ago to Arab units. and. And more and more young Arab Israelis are serving. Now, they still have not assigned them to combat missions. But they will. They will. And, and that's also... I mean, you know, it's, it, it's a fascinating country. And some of the politics is fascinating. They had this thing recently where they had the first um, Arab-Israeli uh, justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. And they have the same problems with the Supreme Court there that we have here, which is it's too liberal and it's too judicial tyranny and they, they, they legislate from the bench but it's a very respected international Supreme Court and this Arab justice the chief justice was retiring and they all stood up teary eyed after tribute to the chief justice and then at the end they all sang the national anthem Hatikva the Hope now the Arab justice stood up he didn't sing it and there's this huge to do I say I frankly think don't make such a big I mean you know okay he didn't sing it but he stood up. He showed respect. But this is this is part of Israeli politics. I mean, I mean, again, one of the things about Israel that's different from a lot of other countries, other than the uh, Mommy's Voice radio show, uh, the, the the dominant media force is news, and there's news every hour, and there's a long news broadcast, and everybody listens. It's the world's biggest bunch of news junkies. And people argue back to the radio, and they're passionate about it. And and what's uh, anyway? They, what's crazy to me is they haven't developed uh, like our equivalent talk radio yet. Well, Michael, thank you very much for both of you.